So how's everybody doing today? Y'all excited? It's the last lecture for the semester? Not exactly. Hey now, there's only one for me, and it's exactly like the other one, right? So you'll, yeah. you'll be fine. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> yeah, I, fair enough. I, I'm just, I'm not a believer in communal of exams. I think you're stupid. I, I think that's all class. That, that is fair. And, and it's it's one of those things where it's like, this is designated specifically as a non-major class. Ultimately, I'm just happy if y'all learned a little bit about ecology and biology and why this stuff is all math, right? So... Did y'all at least learn something cool, something about an organism you didn't know anything about before? How many of y'all actually kind of enjoyed a little bit of that species account thing where you learn something different about something you've never messed with before? Like, there's a two foot long salamander that looks like a giant eel that lives on campus. Who would have thought about that, right? All right, let's get through our announcements quickly so we can get to the more fun part of today's lecture. Um, as always, remember, quiz 14 to do. Just like last time, typical time, typical day. Um, and again, a lot of those questions are going to be stuff that's going to be similar to what you're going to see on the exam coming up. So make sure you do it. All right. The final exam is offered either in person or online. If you want to take it in person, you have to be in here around 10 a.m. on Friday. Please try to be here exactly on time. So that way you're not impeding other people taking the test. But I'll give you all a little bit of wiggle room. I will say, though, if there's nobody else in here that's left that's still taking it. If you come in after that, I can stay that much longer, okay? Um, I'll probably even hand grade the scantrons to be honest with you, just because I'm post Friday, I'm not gonna be in the state. So bear with me. Um, so it may take me a little bit longer to get your test grades back than normal, but my wife and I will get them graded and get them up to the airport. Also um, about the test, remember that it's just 40 questions. It's just on unit four. So make sure you read and watch all the lectures from the last couple of weeks, um, including those two YouTube videos that kind of walk around the Arboretum as well as um, near where I live that show off some of the different invasive species. They'll be pretty helpful for you, not only to kind of back up what you see during the Florida Natural History and the invasive lecture, but as well as everything else. So take advantage of that. And finally, extra credit to today at 11.59 p.m., just so I can have enough time to compile it all. One thing that I've been kind of frustrated with a little bit do not remove other people's names and replace them with yours. I'm a little bit irritated. If I see that you've submitted something that somebody else has already done, I will tell you to redo it. If it's after the due date that I see it, you're SOL. All right? Is that fair? Okay. Now, one thing I will say, if somebody stole yours, let me know so I can double check it. And I can actually look at the change history. So if you email me and let me know and I can double check everything, I'm happy to make sure that you are taken care of. Um, as far as the book goes uh, for finding out where that species is on campus, mm -hmm. would, we, would we be liable to be able to find it on that aspect? Yep. So all of these species that I found, the way I found them is based off of their iNaturalist observations on the perimeter area for campus. Okay. So just go through the map on iNaturalist and use that to pull out your observations for them. Okay. And as far as like home state locations, you get to kind of get a general area. Yeah. Exactly. So like the Arboretum or Lake Clare or okay. that kind of thing. Okay. You don't need to go super into specifics. I, I don't expect y'all to be, you know, amazing biologists. I just want y'all to take a shot at it. Learn a little bit about a species that you never would have paid attention to. Fair enough, right? And it's worth it, right? It's 10% it's towards your next grade. It's a full letter grade depending on how you score. So take advantage of it. All right, let's finish off this invasive stuff so we can actually get the review start. As always, if I'm talking too fast, wave me down. Um, and I apologize again for not being able to get through all of this on Wednesday, but I'm feeling better now, so it's all good. All right. So last time we were kind of, this is the right before everything went down, but um, how do invasive animals actually get introduced? So there's kind of two main options. You can either have accidental releases, which is the predominant route for most of these invasive species showing up in a new location. And then you have incidental uh, introductions, things like failed biological controls. So when you're talking about accidental introductions, it's often things like travel and trade. For instance, a lot of the rats and that kind of thing came over when boats from the uh, Europe came over, they jumped off the boats and then they were able to colonize the people as well. Parasites from ornamental species. 
This is things like uh, anytime you introduce like a new plant into a garden, and then that jumps into the native species, like some sort of bug or something like that. Ballast water and unprocessed natural products. Uh, this happens quite often where just sometimes people dump things that they think is just waste out into the environment, and it turns out they didn't kill everything in it, and it takes over. This is how we got zebra mussels, which is completely destroying the Mississippi River drainage. And then finally, when it comes to intentional introduction, you have classically the failed biological controls. You especially see this in places like Hawaii, where they had the sugarcane beetle that was massively destroying their sugarcane crop. And as a result, they introduced the cane toad to eat those beetles. Turns out, despite their naming conventions, have nothing to do with each other. And as a result, they now have an invasive toad that eats everything. Um, another great example of this is the mongooses that are invasive in Hawaii. They were introduced as a part of a program to get rid of rats. Well, rats live at, or are most active during the night, and mongooses are most active during the day. So the mongoose ate all the birds that lived naturally in Hawaii, which just completely decimated a bunch of different species. So as a result, we're a lot more careful about how we do biological introductions or control introductions. And oftentimes, like I mentioned with the triploid carp back a couple, halfway through the semester, um, they do things that will modify them so they can't reproduce on their own. So it's a little bit more work on the human side of things, but it keeps animals from going out of control. So what exactly happens when you get introduced? They're initially going to start in a very small area. This is called the founder population. They're going to move into this location and start trying to build up their population numbers. Now, as their population establishes and continues to breed, obviously that current area is going to be too small to support them. So they're going to start moving out. And in some cases, that's really easy. And they're going to take over wads or wide swaths of the, all the different land. But it's not always the case. And you may have very localized introductions. Things like Burmese pythons are probably never going to get probably north of Ocala just because of the colder winters and things like that. But they're still an invasive lo localized species at that point. And then ultimately, they're going to move outside of that area, spreading like ripples on a pond, where it's just going to exponentially grow and grow and grow. Now, I do like to talk about this whole attitude towards invasive species because it's pretty. I mean, it can kind of rough. And even today, there's still a lot of people that just indiscriminately kill the, a lot of these animals. And plants, honestly, are fine. They're, who cares about them? But um, when it comes to the animal side of things, it's often not done in a very humane way. So, for instance, um, they have this kind of perspective of you're demonizing these critters and kind of treating them like this is an invasion, a war. But the grand scheme of things, that poor Cuban tree frog doesn't know anything about where it was originally from. It's just an animal trying to live its life. And so even though I do advocate for removing them, you do it humanely. You don't try to just sit there and bash them over the head like an asshole. So you do need to remember that humans are 99% of the time the reason why these animals were put here to begin with. And so we should show them respect when we do remove them if we do remove them. So let's go through a couple species spotlights that I do want to hit that kind of focuses it here on Central Florida. Of course, our Cuban tree frogs, they were initially introduced in the 1920s and have become really established throughout here in Florida. Since I moved down here, or I, I grew up in Florida up until about the early 2000s and then I moved to Georgia and back. When I was living near Brevard County in like the 1990s, there were no Cuban tree frogs in Brevard County. And now they are a massively huge population that range all the way up into like Ocala area. It's kind of interesting to see. They, they outcompete native tree frogs by just becoming just eating them, honestly, and are able to eat all the foods that they eat. And it becomes just a general nuisance because they are mildly toxic. And unfortunately, they're just really difficult to remove because you know a single female can lay hundreds of eggs every year. And of course, we can't talk about invasive amphibians without highlighting the cane toad, which is present primarily in South Florida, although we do have one record of it showing up here at UCF, probably just an individual that hung out on a car. That happens more often than you think, obviously. And they're only just now getting into Tampa with a small population in Sanford. So they are here in Central Florida, but they're just not really doing that well. And they'll eat anything they can. And are poisonous to dogs and cats. In fact, oftentimes, if your dog or cat gets a hold of one of these and they choke on it, the poison glands that are right here, they'll secrete a really like white, milky looking substance. And the animal that's called bufotoxin. And that can often be really deadly for small cats and dogs. So please pay attention to that. 
And they were ultimately introduced as a biocontrol here as well, just like in Hawaii, where we have large sugarcane fields down in South Florida that have destroyed the Everglades. So, you know, there's that. Now, I do have to point this out. I know some of y'all are probably cat people. But with that being said, I really, really encourage y'all to make sure your cats stay indoors. Uh, this species is mostly, a lot of people don't necessarily think of them as an invasive species, right? But in the US, the only small cat species that we have are bobcats, right? They have a very different niche than what a lot of these guys are filling. And as a result, they decimate bird populations, small mammals, and herd populations. And there's been some cases where a single cat has been attributed to 20 different bird extinctions. So keep your cats indoors. Stay new to your cat. Don't let your cat be an outdoor cat. I don't know how many more times I could say that. Now, this group is particularly nasty. These are in red imported uh, fire ants. Nasty little buggers. Not only do they bite like hell, they have a stinging um, after they have a stinger on the bottom of their abdomen. So that's why you get those little welts if you ever get bit by them. They're introduced into Mobile Bay, Alabama in the 1960s through an inadvertent um, introduction. Basically, there was a cargo ship that had some on board. And when they unloaded, they accidentally left some of them there. These things are stupid hardy and are likely causing the decline of numerous different herb species here in the southeast, as well as mammal species. Yes. And over every year, there's millions of them trying to eradicate them, mostly just out of people's yards because they're not pleasant to deal with, right? But you know, they're they're also a pretty big blight on a lot of ecosystems too. So this is a lot of things that I like to point out with these invasive species is it's not just about the environment that they are affecting. They often will affect humans too. Burmese pythons accidentally released in the 1990s, but they have been at least individuals documented since the 1970s, just because South Florida is a weird place. Um, they're decimating the massive native populations of mammals in the Everglades and potentially the as well, where you have numerous species of federally endangered uh, rodents and other mammals as a result of just having these small isolated island populations that are now all interconnected and a python can just run down the road. And the, the probably more concerning thing that I think about with this species is the spread of pentastone, which is a lungworm that is now found, even though the Burmese python has stayed kind of south of uh, probably Vero Beach, this lungworm is now as far north as Ocala and Gainesville. So it's pretty concerning that not only you don't have to have that snake moving forward, the thing that's bringing you with it is just as potentially deadly for a lot of snake species. Now, how many of y'all saw brown and old for one of your observation assignments? How many of y'all before this class realized that they're not supposed to be? Yeah. So brown and olds have become stupid common and have completely replaced green and olds, which are our native species throughout most of the state, especially in more suburban habitats. So say, for instance, if you go out to Wakaiwa Springs or Rock Springs Run or somewhere like that, you're going to see a lot more green and olds than you're going to see brown and olds. But here on campus, you almost can't take a step without the nearly damn stepping on one, right? Um, and unfortunately, they are spreading into other states. Texas, Georgia, South Carolina are all starting to see a lot more of these things. In fact, I like to tell this story. I had one individual that um, got into my parents' car and rode with us all the way up to North Carolina, and we happened to find it just running along the floor floorboard. And you can see really quickly, just from a simple story like that, how these things can get, up, get out of hand really quickly. Now, yeah. So with brown animals, um, the reason why they're so effective against green animals is typically just out comp out competing them. They don't they aren't necessarily or, uh, cannibalistic like you dissociate with the null on a null or the tree frog cannibalism that you see in Cuba. Uh, human tree frogs, sorry. <laughs> Make that very clear. Um, I'm really bad at doing that. My bad. Um, but the big thing is with the brown knolls is they're going to just take over the niche that the green knolls normally occupy. Mm -hmm. And the reason why the green knolls still do okay in some of those massive areas is green knolls are better climbers, and so they can often go up much higher in the canopy. Now, once you get down to South Florida in the Miami area, there's like 10 other different species. It's so damn hard to keep track of them. Now, all this is kind of futile. Um, 
So it, it can be just kind of a problem to deal with. And oftentimes you, it's really difficult to actually remove them. You're just kind of stuck left, just kind of controlling the spread of them. Fortunately, once you kind of let something out of the bag, the horse out of the barn, however you want to say it, you're pretty much SOL. So now note, I did have a case study that we did have originally in the lecture that we would have done on Wednesday. But honestly, we don't really need to get into that too much. One thing I will say is it highlighted another species called Xenophus tropicalis or the African clawed frog that we even have a demonstration of what they look like up here. That unfortunately, as a result of them being present in certain wetlands, the disease in some wetlands are really much higher than it should be. And even the weirder part, the disease in some wetlands is even doing better than it should be. In other words, the disease basically dropped out completely. So you have a case where by those frogs being there, it dilutes the amount of disease in some disease aspects. So for one disease, it dilutes it. And for another disease, it increases it. So it's kind of a, this weird, it's not quite beneficial, but it's not quite harmful either. And it all kind of depends on what grade you're looking at. So I like to highlight that as a way to show measuring the effects of an invasive species can often be really difficult. So, all right. So let's go ahead and just jump into some review questions for anybody that has any questions. Um, feel free to just shout them out. Um, as we're doing this review side of things, feel free to like, as long as you're kind of quiet, come up, <clears throat> come up front and actually see some of the critters that we have. Let me kind of talk through and show you what we have first so you can have an understanding of what's going on up here. So over here on the far right, my far right and your far left, um, are three invasive amphibians. So in this big jar, you have American bullfrogs, which mind you, here in Florida, they're not invasive. They max out at about that big here. They do not do that in Arizona. In fact, the largest tadpole ever recorded for bullfrogs was recorded in Arizona because they have no natural predators and they eat just about damn near anything. And of course, we have our wonderful little Xenophus tropicalis, like I mentioned. But in the live side of things, right in front of it, you have a Cuban tree frog. So your classic example of if you've never seen one before, now you get a chance to. Um, one thing I do want to remind you all is please don't pick them up unless I pick them up for you. And the reason for that is, especially with some of the amphibians, they have very sensitive skin. And ultimately, we're here to protect the animals and make sure they stay okay so they can do more of these events, right? So please be careful of that. Here we have a southern leopard frog, classic species from those temporary wetlands like we talked about on Wednesday. They pretty much only breed in those wetlands and they do really well. In them. Next to it is the southern toad. And this is one of the biggest southern toads I've ever seen. She is absolutely massive and was completely uprooting my garden. So that's why she's here. Um, <laughs> now with her, what's really interesting about her is you can see, and I'll try to pull up a picture of a cane toad in the background so you can see the differences. Southern toads are obviously our native species are supposed to be here. But the cane toads have a lot different of a build to them. They're, they're, uh, so the genus that they're in is called Rhinella, which basically means beaked toads. And if you look, they have a much more pointed shape to their uh, mouth, as well as if you look at this one, even though she's massive, her parathroid glands, which are the glands that produce those poison, are still relatively small. Whereas in a cane toad, they're big and bulbous and take up like most of the neck. Next to them, we have two different species of turtle shells. So you can see kind of your classic, what we call mitid turtles, your pond turtles. Uh, so we have a Florida or a peninsula cooter here and a uh, common slider here. Uh, common sliders are kind of interesting because they do have an invasive variant that does show up. So I'm not a big believer in subspecies. I think they're kind of stupid, honestly. But um, with common sliders, they have a very uh, invasive subspecies termed the red eared slider, Trachomy scriptum elegans. I'm pretty sure that's what that one is, but I'm not 100%. And that's been introduced as a result of a lot of pet invasions where, as you can tell, that's a pretty sizable turtle. When most people buy them, they're that big. And that thing needs 100 to probably a 200 gallon aquarium. When they're first bought, they get thrown in little five gallon aquariums and then they quickly outgrow them in about, this is about a year and a half of swing of growth in theory. So there's some things to think about. Don't get a pet before you actually know what you're doing. YouTube is your friend. Learn what they what their actual life histories are. Don't be irresponsible, because that's how we get invasive species. And then over here, I have two different species of salamander. We have the Chattanooga uh, slimy salamander, which are kind of interesting because they produce this slime that's incredibly sticky. In fact, sometimes when we were in the field working on these guys in the mountains of North Carolina, we literally dab some on our paper and use it to like attach paper together. <laughs> so ridiculous. 
Uh, they're really cool because they have these very interesting hybrid zones where they'll integrate with these mountaintop species. And as a result um, of climate change, we can see where these zones are occurring is radically shifting. And it's really fascinating. I'd encourage you to look into it. And then we have uh, one of the other species of salamanders up here. It's called the uh, Blue Ridge 2 line salamander. There's like three different species that all look exactly the same, but genetically they're completely different. And so we call those cryptic species, which basically means that we wouldn't have known that they were different species if we didn't look for that genetically. And so that kind of calls into question how valid is the species concept and how do we handle that kind of stuff. So I like to always point that out. And of course, because I have to show that I'm not biased towards my herbs, I have a uh, drive. Um, outer shell of an armadillo. Yes, it's a little stinky, but it's really cool because you can actually see how those dermal plates are formed. And I have the beak of a toucan, which you can actually still see some of the color that's leached out. It's still leached out a little bit of its color, but you can still see some of what would normally be there. So I'll have Katie around that can help answer questions while I'm still kind of answering the questions, but feel free to come up and see some. All right, so did anybody have any questions before the test? Fair enough. I feel like most people are honestly pretty comfortable with this material. Don't hesitate to just come ask me up in front in person, too. I'm happy to, you know, talk about stuff. With that being said, before we kind of like get all this combobulated here, I do want to say something that y'all have been awesome. I know that this semester has been a shit show, both on my end and on the university end. But know that I really appreciate y'all bearing through with me uh, with my first like, in person class like this. I know it was a little frustrating at times, and there's stuff that I still screw up every now and then, but just know that I really appreciate y'all being pretty reasonable with me and, and just kind of calling me when I do screw up on things, but not being too bad about it. All right? Let's see some critters. <laughs> 